thank all of you, and I've heard quite a number of interesting uh, ideas that I'll sprinkle in here. So we want to talk about beyond, measuring and designing ourselves. What do we mean by that? What are the challenges and risks in there? I'm going to put it in the context of personalgenomes.org. This is a project that really has engaged all of you, or some of you anyway, in measuring and, uh, yourself in every way possible and sharing that with the entire world. It's the only project where that kind of sharing goes on. And we've heard a lot about sharing in this meeting. It's really inspiring. So can we read and change minds? With electrodes, yes, we can. And this is done with epileptics. And some of you may have known that you can identify a single human neuron that responds to uh, Jennifer Aniston and this individual who was uh, epileptic, and not to other uh, uh, faces and sometimes to the names as well as the face, the concepts there. Obviously, there are many neurons involved. Now, as we get better at, at measuring and changing uh, with electronics, with drugs, with genes, and so forth, are we going to eliminate these things, which can be quite uh, troubling to families, or are we going to diversify? That is to say, we have Edison, a famous narcoleptic, Churchill, uh, JFK, Abe Lincoln are, are subjects of some of these uh, popular books recently. We want to manage these things, but, but we want to retain the diversity that, uh, that may be painful to family and individual, but be quite valuable to society. Now, I showed those wires sticking into somebody's head. That's obviously not scalable or desirable on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, even for epileptics. Um, this is getting closer, wireless rather than wires. Uh, this is a uh, PGP number two. We use numbers even though we're not de-identified. This is John Halamka, I can use his name. Um, his data, his genome data, and many of his trait data, his medical records are all online. And he was one of the first people to have this radio frequency idea like you have in the store, put in his arm, and he, he talked about it in Journal of, of uh, New England Journal of Medicine. And in addition to measurements of all sorts uh, and genomics, we're really trying to get these individuals thinking about uh, sharing. Testmybrain.org is, uh, is addictive if you go there, uh, learn about yourself. Um, here on the far left is uh, sections through one of our uh, brains, actually my brain. Thankfully, it was the fMRI sections rather than actual sections. Uh, <laughs> uh, and then, uh, in the middle, there are sections through, again, my cells that are now, and, and uh, PGP number nine cells as well, Rosalind Gill, where they've uh, been reprogrammed uh, into uh, an embryonic-like state and then to respiratory epithelium and neuroectoderm and liver cells and you name it. And you can see they look kind of similar between two different individuals. That wireless thing in the arm of John Halamka is expanding rapidly in the last couple of years. And you see a little bit in this meeting this, this quantified self uh, uh, ability to, to measure heart and, and uh, accelerometers and sleep, the Zio and so forth. But you can now measure ultrasound, EKG, and so forth on things that are very similar to tattoos or bandages in the case of this. Uh, and Qualcomm and others are, that are into wireless are obviously into this. And this, as we get... Uh, Tired of the last thing in our cell phones, uh, this is where we're going. Do-it-yourself biology. You can get very affordable little kits or toys for your kid so they can determine who their father is and other <laughs> <coughs> innocent activities like that. <laughs> cell phones. We have early adopters who drive this technology and they pay a fortune for their first cell phone, but then it gets to the point where there's six billion cell phones on the planet. Everybody has access to them. And, uh, and that's what we want, is we want this to be, to draw, to early adopters to drive the cost down. And here's uh, my old friend, uh, Jeff Tabin, who spent enough time climbing in the Himalayas. He paid back by training barefoot doctors to do this interocular lens replacement for the cataracts. They're so common in the Sherpas and, and other people that live in this area, high altitude. And they can do it for $20, uh, 175 times less expensive than Jeff would do it here in the United States. And this is the power of, uh, of cost reduction. Amazing cost curve. Uh, you've already heard a little bit earlier in this uh, meeting. But it's just shocking to me, even though I'm in the thick of it, 
is we brought it down from $3 billion, the cost of the largest building in the world, down to $1,000, so, so little that now it, get, it can get mixed in uh, and the cover, re costs are covered by the individual or the, or the group that's providing the, the, the sequencing, like the Personal Genomes Project. Now, these awesome technologies are only as good as our ability to share. I think we've heard enough in this meeting just how great it is to share. You're no good if you have the only cell phone in the world or you're the only contributor to the World Wide Web or Wikipedia. Three quick examples of, of students. You say, well, undergraduate at MIT, of course she can sequence her own gene. Uh, <laughs> she, she, has, uh, she has hemochromatosis going in her family, and she wanted to find out whether she had it or not, no matter what the FDA had to say about it. That was covered in Boston Globe. Okay, we're up to stakes a little bit now. Uh, you know, your 11th grader, this is what they have to do for their biology project. Uh, which is, uh, she sequenced all, uh, four members of her family and analyzed their, their data. Um, and in their family, they had factor V Leiden, which actually caused a pul pulmonary embolism in her father. Nick Volker, uh, this, this kid had multiple intestinal surgeries. And uh, they decided to sequence him, completely changed the diagnosis to uh, an immune one. He got a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, and he's uh, fine almost immediately and, and still. Individually rare, but, but, but increasingly uh, collectively common. 2,000 of these diseases that can be diagnosed and growing rapidly. And it's important to think, we think of, oh, you know, these, these rare diseases like Tay-Sachs and cystic fibrosis that we're trying to, to uh, eliminate. But rare is not necessarily bad. Flex Wheeler has a, a myostatin mutation. He also works out. But you can, see, <laughs> you, can, you can see that some of these animals have exactly the same mutations. So it is something that we understand quite deeply. In addition to lean muscle mass uh, and r lower atherosclerosis risk, you get some people have LRP, rare LRP mutations that make the extra strong bones, almost unbreakable. Uh, you have people that have PCSK9, which makes them almost impossible to clog up their arteries no matter what they eat. And then virus resistant. I have something about viruses, so I'm going to give you three examples of how you can fight them. Forget it, this is not, this goes way beyond vaccines or drugs. These are three non-vaccine, non-drugs. This, this person was cured of leukemia and AIDS by getting stem cells from someone who happened to not only be compatible with them, but also being deleted for the AIDS virus receptor. And that's been now turned into a serendipitous transplant into a phase one clinical trial. It looks very promising where they take your T cells out, change the genes, and put them back. That's one way of fighting AIDS, not drugs, not vaccines. Here's another way. No matter, there are rare individuals, just like that rare case before, who have antibodies that are exquisitely uh, unusual and they'll stick into a conserved part of the HIV um, surface. And this is uh, not something that everybody gets. There's not necessarily a vaccine that will create this. But once you find it, you can share this antibody with other people at risk. And this, I think, is a very interesting possibility. And the third and most far-fetched at all, but something that we're getting fairly close to for industrial microorganisms and hopefully soon thereafter agricultural and maybe even medical applications, is actually changing the genetic code, changing the genome-wide um, one or more of the 64 triplets that constitute your genetic code. Viruses come in, and they see this foreign code, and they have no idea what to do. This is amazing technology, and like the sequencing technology, it's been coming down by factors of 10 per year for about six years. It's much faster than the... Than the computer and electronics curves, and so we can look forward to our ability to change genomes as we do this. Finally, um, living healthy lives for a long time. Well, this is something that's clearly programmed into us. Mice live for two years. Bowhead whales there on the far right uh, will live for, for 100 times as long, 200 plus years. There's a general tendency toward size, but you can find outliers that, that are li especially long-lived uh, in, in spite of the particular size distribution. And naked mole rat, the really ugly one on the left there, is something that uh, we're, we have a special affection for. Not only does it live a long time, um, 10 times longer than most other rodents, but it also has social behavior like uh, bees with queens and workers and soldiers. 
and it's resistant to pain and a lot of other interesting things. Um, and not just are we interested in exceptionally long-lived animals, but exceptionally long-lived human beings. And you're going to see a lot more of this. We're going to learn all the ways that humans can live longer. Here is Jean Clement on her 121st birthday. She had uh, stopped smoking on her 117th. Uh, <laughs> Uh, she had been doing it since she was 21, uh, not because of health reasons, but because she was afraid she was going to set something on fire, I think. Uh, so these people are very healthy in spite of the environments that they put themselves on. She also drank you know, wine and ate lots of chocolate. I'm not sure whether that's a uh, kilogram a week, uh, if you want to try to implement that. Uh, and so anyway, we're, we're sequencing these, we and others are sequencing these long-lived uh, animals and humans, and we hope that this will be part of a bigger project to measure and design uh, uh, humans going forward. So period, full stop. Thank you very much.